Well, good morning and thank you everyone for joining our session for the Virtual Brain Cloud project. My name is Katerina Stevanovic and I'm the project manager at TP21 for the Virtual Brain Cloud. Alongside uh, Alzheimer, Alzheimer Europe's uh, Angela Bradshaw, I will be the moderator for this session. And now to introduce the project. The Virtual Brain Cloud is a European project funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 Framework Program for Research and Innovation. The goal of the Virtual Brain Cloud is personalized prevention and treatment of dementia. The Virtual Brain Cloud builds a generic framework for managing the life cycle of sensitive data and to leverage the potential of big personal data and high performance computing. The resulting uh, product is uh, open source, portable, GDPR compliant, and aligns with other platform projects. The Virtual Brain Cloud combines the expertise of 17 interdisciplinary partners um, of the European Union, of which 12 are research institutions, including a supercomputing center. There are four SMEs and Alzheimer Europe as the patient organization. The Virtual Brain Cloud is funded by, um, with 15 million for the duration of four years uh, that started in December of 2018 and will run until November of 2022. The consortium is coordinated by Professor Dr. Petra Ritter, from whom we will hear from next, and as well as our other project partners, uh, whom we'll hear of, uh, Martin Hoffman Apitius from Fraunhofer Institute and Victor Girsa from Ex Masse University. And now we're ready to begin with the talks. Uh, as Angela mentioned, for questions, we will have time following all three talks for a discussion and a questions and answer session. And now let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Petra Ritter. Dr. Petra Ritter has studied uh, medicine at Charité University of uh, Medicine in Berlin. She spent a large part of her clinical traineeships and practical years abroad at universities such as UCLA, uh, UCSD, the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, and the Harvard Medical School in Boston. In 2002, she received her license to practice medicine, and in 2004, completed her doctoral thesis at Charité. In 2010, she received habilitation in um, experimental neurology. After being Max Planck Monero Research Project Leader from 2011 to 2015, she assumed uh, the lifetime position of BIH Johanna Quant Professor for Brain Simulation at the BIH and Charité University of, Ber of Medicine in Berlin. Um, since 2017, Petra is the director of the Brain Simulation section at Charité. So Petra, I give you now the word. Thank you very much for this nice introduction, uh, Katarina. Um, I will now share my screen. So first of all, welcome everybody and thanks to um, Angela Bradshaw for um, organizing this parallel session and for inviting us to present the virtual brain cloud project. So I will be talking about um, the content of the project and I will also show some data that we have generated. And at the heart of um, the Virtual Brain Cloud project is Brain Simulation, that's a virtual brain simulation platform that enables um, modeling of candidate mechanisms of neurodegeneration. So here you see how the Virtual Brain Platform works. Basically what we do is we use scans of individuals, of patients and healthy uh, controls and based on the multimodal information of these individual brain scans, we construct brain network models. And uh, this does not only provide us um, kind of multi-scale atlases of the brain, but we can also really um, simulate uh, these brains, uh, like, uh, for example, flight simulators on the computer. And this is how it looks like. This is the software, the graphical user interface of the virtual brain. We can run simulations of neuronal activity in the entire brain. We can simulate 
EEG, electroencephalograms, magnet encephalograms, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and then we have elaborated tools to analyze the evolving dynamics and the underlying rules. And the nice thing about the virtual brain is that we have all these brain models of individuals in the computer, and we can test different therapeutic interventions like uh, drug application or um, um, surgery directly on the computer, not worrying about adverse effects for the individual. So in the virtual brain cloud, the goal is to use this data integration through multi-scale simulation and to collect multimodal data um, neurodegenerative diseases are multifactorial diseases that have um, genetic groundings, but also many other additional factors that play a role. And therefore, we need to accumulate uh, different types of data from imaging to genetics um, to lifestyle factors in our multi-scale models. Um, Katarina mentioned already the consortium consists of 17 partners. Four partners are small or medium sized enterprises, and we have the patient organization Alzheimer Europe also on board. So, in order to make our predictions generalizable and also applicable for individuals, we need to deal with personal data. So, we cannot really anonymize the data that we are doing research on in order to um, reveal the, the insights that, that we are looking for. And this requires um, computational infrastructures that allow to process and simulate um, large cohort data sets. But those secure um, computational infrastructures are presently largely missing in Europe. Um, we have the general data protection regulations that protect the rights and freedoms of the individuals behind the data. And this requires um, special data protection concepts. And, with the virtual brain cloud, we are filling this gap. We are developing um, solutions with elaborated data protection concepts to be able to do this large scale data integration um, collaboratively. We are building a gener generic framework for managing the life cycle of big personal data. We develop standardized interfaces, are aligning with um, other platforms, for example, of the Human Brain Project and the European Open Science Cloud. We are developing secure gateways to high-performance computing. All our developments are open source, portable, GDPR compliant, and we are fostering an ecosystem of developers evolving further the platform upon the end of the project. Um, Central is also a legal help desk because we are aware of the difficulties given by the relatively new um, laws provided by GDPR and many heterogeneous local laws that provide um, support and help in form of templates for concerns and data sharing um, agreements, for example. So for the data protection concept, we include many different mechanisms to keep the data as private as possible. This includes authenticated end-to-end -end encryption, key architectures, access control, firewalls and sandboxes, monitoring and incident handling, secure deletion data ephemerality, regular updates, training of human resources and shared responsibilities. We are a very collaborative project. Um, we have many partnerships. Um, uh, first of all, we have contracted a Canadian based non for profit, um, small or medium sized uh, enterprise in dog research for the technical coordination of our project. They have uh, much experience in developing health data platforms, open source health data platforms for universities and, and hospitals. Um, we also um, collaborate tightly with local virtual research environment at the Charité in Berlin that provides um, a first production environment for the virtual brain cloud, um, coping with all the necessary uh, data protection requirements. We are also collaborating with HBP and eBrains. Um, we are a partnering project, in fact, of the Human Brain Project and are co-developing solutions there as well. We are involved in the European Open Science Cloud. Um, in particular, we are part of the architecture work <coughs> and the virtual brain simulation engine, of course, plays a central role for our consortium. And last but not least, we have um, several stakeholders um, from industry and other relevant uh, parties in our technical advisory board 
one of which is Brain Commons, a big platform being developed in the US, um, of which the CEO Megali has um, as um, the technical advisory board providing advice. So as I mentioned already, one central partnership is with the Human Brain Project, the European flagship um, initiative, and their e-infrastructure platform, eBrains, where you also find the virtual brain. And there in the past two years already, we have established workflows um, with this e integrated with this e-infrastructure for the virtual brain. So the blue column here shows different workflows related to virtual brain simulation and data processing in order to bring the imaging data in the format that is required for brain simulation. And the many little arrows indicate how we connected these components to the existing infrastructure and services of eBrain. So you can run, for example, the virtual brain or the pipelines via Jupyter notebooks from the common workbench of eBrain, the collaboratory, but you can also submit uh, computing intensive jobs via the Unicore um, API to the high performance computing provided by um, eBrains and the Human Brain Project. Also, the pipelines um, put out data um, fully annotated, so they provide the metadata that are necessary for ingestion of the resulting um, data in the um, data repositories of eBrains. Um, via the knowledge graph. The knowledge graph is a data management system of eBrains. And through that um, comprehensive annotation, uh, the data will be findable um, and reusable. So of course, um, the, the outcome of the virtual brain and the virtual brain cloud project um, aims to um, have impact in the health tech sector to be beneficial for patients. Um, be it um, patients with epilepsy or in the case of the virtual brain cloud um, consortium for patients with neurodegenerative disease by identifying new um, uh, mechanisms um, for potential therapeutic intervention, but also um, for early detection of um, Alzheimer's disease and prediction of the disease trajectory. Um, but this is not the only benefit. We are working very internationally, as you might have noticed already. And this is one byproduct, a uh, public outreach um, uh, brain atlas, which you find under this URL. This is part of the Human Brain Project traveling exhibition, as you can see here. It is available in many languages, including Hebrew and Arabic, and um, uh, yeah, provides a nice a link between the different uh, countries and continents. Um, another benefit of these large-scale collaborative projects um, on, on brain um, function is that the principles that we derive from the brain, the brain is a very complex system, can be also applied to other uh, challenges, uh, complex challenges of, of our society. For example, now um, to the COVID uh, pandemics, but also to questions related to climate change. And here this should illustrate the complexity of the, the interactions and processes and neurodegenerative disease. Um, we have many different factors of many, at many different scales that are interacting, starting from the genes. Um, so there are different genetic uh, influences depending on the type of Alzheimer's disease. In the case of the familial Alzheimer's disease that starts early, for example, the APP, um, and the um, uh, presenilin uh, 1 play a major role. Here you see the different pathways. There's a, um, a positive or good pathway of um, processing APP, amyloid precursor protein, and a bad pathway. The bad pathway leads to a form of the beta amyloid that is aggregating and depositing in the brain and also acts uh, neurotoxically and um, has an, um, um, a potential impact on another protein, which is a tau protein that plays also a role in uh, Alzheimer's disease and neurodegeneration in general, that um, leads to, um, if it is hyperphosphorylated, uh, aggregation in the axons of the neurons and to an impairment of the transport of the vesicles and also the, the, the transport of the information, the signaling in the axons. 
Because this is at the, the, the genetic level, as I mentioned, there are differences for uh, different types of Alzheimer's disease, for the late onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, for example, um, the apolipoprotein E uh, plays a major role, um, and um, there are genome wide association studies that have found that about 40, so up to now 40 different loci. Um, on the genes um, um, increase the risk of developing late onset Alzheimer's disease. And they are associated with metabolic uh, pathways, with a lipoprotein pathways, with the activation of microglia, so this immunological um, uh, processes, um, but also with the pathway of the um, amyloid precursor protein and the beta amyloid um, aggregation. I mentioned already there are two central uh, proteins, the beta amyloid and the tau protein, that play a role uh, through either deposition um, uh, in the extracellular space or through uh, accumulation uh, within the axons, which leads to, again, uh, new inflammation and cell death, um, uh, but also to an impairment of, of the signaling um, itself within the axon. Um, this actually then um, leads to disconnection effects on the neuronal level. So if you go here, um, the cell death um, caused by the proteins, by the neuroinflammation, and the dysfunction of, of the signaling leads to disconnection at the network level and to um, finally um, a dysfunction of, 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 of cognition to cognitive impairment. Um, maybe it's also worth to mention here in this, uh, for this figure that neurotransmitters, of course, also play a role um, for the communication in the brain, and especially in Alzheimer's disease, acetyl acetylcholine um, um, uh, and glutamate uh, play a major role for glutamate. We have an increase, increased excitation and increased transmission of glutamate, and therefore um, glutamate antagonists or NMDA receptor antagonists are used um, for improving the symptoms in dementia um, and uh, decreasing the glutamatergic um, transmission and hyperexcitation. And vice versa, um, acetylcholine um, esterase uh, uh, inhibitors increase the presence of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine that is important for memory formation, for example. So now the question is, how can we integrate these many different ingredients and pathways in our modeling approaches? And I will show you an example here, how we um, started this process. So here again, you see the cascade of the formation of um, beta amyloid plaques that are um, one um, prominent feature in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, so the, the bad pathway um, that leads to the generation of beta amyloid oligomers and um, beta plaques um, can be actually captured by non-invasive measurements with positron emission tomography. So here you see the distribution of beta amyloid as measured with PET. Um, and from um, other studies, we know that in the vicinity of these beta amyloid plaques, the function of the inhibitory interneurons is impaired. And this leads to disinhibition of the excitatory neurons, hyperexcitation, and uh, the other cascades that I have just discussed on the previous um, slide. So we can now actually um, benefit from the, the knowledge uh, the, um, of the dis distribution of beta amyloid in an individual and map this into our brain models and um, link the beta amyloid burden to the function of the inhibitory interneurons. And this uh, we do um, here. We have uh, the one population model. So each of these brain regions represented by such a population model that represents inhibitory um, neurons, pyramidal cells here in the middle, and excitatory interneurons. And we now map the beta amyloid burden for each individual region coming from individual PET scans on the coupling between the inhibitory um, interneurons and the pyramidal cells. And when we do this, um, we can measure then the activity of the pyramidal cells and the inhibitory interneurons. 
what you see here is the phase space spent by the membrane potential of the pyramidal cells and the inhibitory interneurons. And we see that the activity, the membrane potentials of the two depends on how much input they get from the surrounding brain network. And depending on the input, different dynamic um, uh, repertoires can evolve. So for example, here, with this input, we get large membrane potential oscillations. Here we get smaller oscillations. And here, at that black line, we get no oscillations. And the many errors indicate the many possibilities, so depending on where you start um, the process. So this is uh, the, the, the situation um, if we do not consider the beta amyloid plug. But if we now um, consider the beta amyloid plug that changes the coupling between these pyramidal cells and the inhibitory interneurons, um, we can see the impact of, of this altered coupling. And the, the beta amyloid uh, or the coupling is reflected here by this parameter J, the control parameter this, that is now step by step changed. And you will see that with each change of this control parameter that depends on the beta amyloid burden in each individual region, the dynamic repertoire of this, um, um, of this the pyramidal cells and the inhibitory interneurons changes. And here on the right, you see the resulting simulated local field potentials, or also EG. And we see that with increasing beta amyloid load, there's a change of the dynamic repertoire represented by the different ge geometric uh, uh, figures here that results in, this, uh, in a slowing of the local field potentials on the EG. And this is what we see indeed in the patients. Um, so here, this is a simulation for three groups, Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, and healthy controls, indicated by the different colors. And here on the x-axis, you see the dominant frequencies. And we see that only by inclusion of the beta amyloid plugs from the PET data, we get a slowing in the simulated EG and the theta frequency range. So with this simulation, we can make the link between the protein cascade and the observation of the EG uh, slowing in patients. And in this way, understand the, the processes and mechanisms that couple these observations together. But we can also um, further benefit from this by now including our simulated data, the local field potentials, or EG, um, as features in um, predictive models that um, should either predict the disease course or classify between different disease stages or disease categories. And this is preliminary work that I'm just showing you here today, where we looked how much adding uh, simulate, simulation inferred features like local field potentials to um, the feature space will improve the classification between mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease and healthy controls. So this is just the starting point. And we see here, this is the confusion matrix for the empirical features. This is a confusion matrix for combined empirical features and simulated features. And if we look just at the mild cognitive impairment classification, there's a significant improvement. And here on the right, you see the change of um, uh, predictive accuracy if we use empirical data only, simulated data only, or the combination thereof. And we find best predictive accuracy if we use a combination of empirical data and simulation and third features. And of course, we are interested to see what are the relevant features from our simulations for this classification and for the local field potentials. These are the local field potentials in the bilateral salamis. So the simulated salamic local field potentials significantly contribute to the improvement of classification between mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. This is the final slide of, of my presentation that shows you the possibility to also test drug effects um, on our virtual brains. So what you see here again are the three uh, groups, Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, healthy control, and the simulated frequencies, the dominant frequencies, and for Alzheimer's disease you see that especially slow frequencies around SETA are predominant. Here you see our population model, and we now test a virtual effect of memantine, the NMDA, NMDA antagonist that decreases basically the, the hyper excitation caused by glutamate by blocking the coupling between excitatory interneurons and pyramidal cells. And you, if we just apply this virtual memantine, we see a normalization, the dotted red line of the Alzheimer patients towards the baseline of the mild cognitive impair and healthy controls. 
And we hope that in the future, this can be done on an individual level, this is a group level to predict the, the therapeutic effect of certain interventions in individual patients. This is, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, I'm happy later to take questions in the discussion round. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Petra, for all the information and the very nice presentation. Now I will introduce uh, Professor Dr. Martin uh, Hoffman Apitius, who will follow next with the presentation. Martin Hoffman Apitius holds a uh, PhD in molecular biology and has an extensive expertise in functional genomics and applied bioinformatics. He has experience in both academic and industrial research. Since 2002, he has led the Department of Bioinformatics at Fraunhofer Institute for Algorithms and Scientific Computing in St. Augustin in Germany. And in July 2006, he was appointed as a professor for Applied Life Science Informatics at Bonn Aachen International Center for Information Technology. Professor Hoffman Apitius was an academic initiator and co-coordinator uh, of the Etionomy, an IMI project aimed at generating mechanism-based taxonomy of neurodegenerative diseases. He is also involved in related IMI projects such as EPAD and Radar AD, and is also a work package leader at the Virtual Brain Cloud Project. Martin. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, pleasure to be here with you. So thanks for having me. Um, it was good to listen to Petra's talk um, because uh, that paved the way and I don't have to really introduce the Virtual Brain Cloud uh, Project uh, anymore. What we have been bringing to the TVB Cloud project was essentially uh, what we have done in the autonomy project before. And I try to, uh -huh, to um, simply give you a brief overview on, on what I'm going to talk about. Um, this talk is about integrative approaches that bring data and knowledge together in a way that they are largely interoperable. I would also like to uh, introduce a holistic approach uh, that is looking actually at all the data and all the knowledge out there on disease mechanisms in Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism in particular, uh, approaches to make knowledge computable, um, make data and knowledge talk to each other, and uh, in particular also answering one of the very fundamental questions in translational neurodegeneration research which is uh, to what extent are our study data uh, comparable? Because what, uh, what you have seen uh, from, uh, from Peter's talk just uh, a few minutes ago, is typically um, you know, focusing on, on available data set, on the very few available data sets that are um, widely used in the community. There's nothing wrong with that. But the question is, of course, uh, does that generalize what we observe there? And I would also shed some light on the uh, attempts to pave the road towards uh, simulating long-term disease processes and bringing the two worlds together, my world, as I will outline it now, and the world of Petra that you have seen uh, just a minute ago. So in autonomy, the task was uh, essentially to try to uh, tell subpopulations, and I hope you can see my cursor, you, um, subpopulations in a, in a mixture of patients or uh, subjects affected uh, and dis discriminate between subgroups uh, based on uh, a mechanistic understanding of what's going on. And that of course would lay the foundation for and the basis for drug development and therapy. That's the nice idea. And that was the underlying concept of autonomy. Underlying was also that we tried the first time, I think in the, in the entire domain to do a holistic approach that integrates all the uh, data and all the knowledge for Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism. So what did we do? We uh, captured and represented uh, the majority of the knowledge in the domain uh, in, in, a, in a graph system, in a, in a graph-based uh, approach that is quite common in the knowledge domain that we work with graphs no time to go really into any detail. The only thing that you should keep in mind is those graphs represent knowledge across scales. 
So it can start with, for instance, epigenetics or uh, genetic variation level uh, to molecular level of proteins interacting, proteins binding chemicals and drugs, uh, antibiological processes and pathways uh, up to the clinical level where we see cognition tests or neuroimaging readouts and parcellations as Petra just showed them beautifully in the, uh, in the uh, animation. So the, the knowledge representation format that we are using is able to integrate that and to represent that knowledge across scales in one single graph. And that's what you see here, for instance, as an example in the inflammatory response subgraph. For Alzheimer, we have come up with 124 of those uh, mechanistic uh, explanations how Alzheimer, uh, what, what the underlying etiology is of Alzheimer. And we had something like 78 or 77 um, of those graphs for Parkinsonism. We did also a systematic uh, evaluation of uh, available data that are out there that we could get our hands on. Uh, that's easily said, but um, try to really get the majority of longitudinal uh, study data into your hands. That is something that will take you months and years because the preparedness of the international community to share data is limited. I think we at Sky uh, and, and, my, and my team are now one of the groups with the largest collection worldwide in uh, longitudinal uh, study data and uh, Colin Birkenbiel and my team has done an overall survey uh, of modalities available. So essentially what has been measured in those, in those studies uh, and did this uh, nice overview here on all these different studies that you see here um, as cohorts. Now the question is really are those, um, are those study data sets comparable beyond just the mere uh, mapping of variables onto each other. Are the patterns underlying progression of disease in those data sets comparable? That's a key question and that has been answered now recently. The, the paper is now accepted for publication. Again, Colin Birkenbiel, um, who's doing a wonderful job uh, uh, in work package four of uh, um, TBB Cloud, <coughs> uh, uh, together with, with um, our team, but also with the at Neuromed team, for instance, Simon Lovestone and, and uh, colleagues in Oxford, um, and the Japanese Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, and of course, ADNI, uh, have uh, come up with a complete evaluation of the Alzheimer's disease data landscape. That's a complete overview on progression patterns uh, in, in, the major, um, in the major study data available. So the background for this study is that um, the basis for progression models are cohort data sets. That's trivial, that's straightforward. But um, in order to generalize, we need to validate and to reproduce the patterns we observe uh, in independent data sets. That also tr sounds trivial, but <laughs> nobody has really done that before. You know? We are overanalyzing ADNI like crazy, and we are ignoring largely what happens in other uh, data sets. <clears throat> However, uh, we could show already a while ago that distinct cohorts underlie distinct biases. This is due to the study design. This is nothing you know, uh, well, bad or so. It's just that people collect patients and, and subjects for study based on different premises. Um, and the previous work we have done showed the influence of these core deviations and the limited uh, uh, comparability of different cohorts just based on, uh, on variable spaces, for instance. Question was now, and that's a very fundamental question, uh, do progression patterns differ across different cohorts? So uh, do these cohorts show different, maybe subpopulation specific progression patterns? And the question technically that arises from the previous question is, how do, how do we measure cohort similarity? How do we compare progression patterns? So the methodology is based on data mining um, and modeling of progression patterns uh, in these sync cohort data sets, compare the patterns across cohorts, and uh, compare trained models 
for instance, models that represent um, the longitudinal behavior of individual cohorts. And that's exactly what we did. Um, we, we, we are using multi-state models, MSMs for that, which essentially um, no different states. Uh, these are typically the diagnostic states like control, mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease in the, in the AD field. And then we look at the conversion, uh, essentially the um, event of somebody crossing the line between control and MCI or crossing the line between MCI and AD. And actually there should be an arrow back from AD to MCI, uh, at least when you look at the data that uh, Jean-François de Monet and, and uh, Lausanne has, where in their memory clinic, they have actually revertance from AD to MCI. But the, typically, the, the typical belief in the, in the, um, in the multi-state models is that there's no way back from AD to MCI. Um, we are looking for covariates um, like uh, age, sex, and year of education, the APOE status, APOE, as you know, what being one of the major genetic determinants of Alzheimer's risk. And uh, we looked at uh, MMSE as a common readout used in most of the studies. Uh, we are computing uh, covariate hazard ratios. We are looking at sojourn times, so how long you stay uh, in, in, uh, in a given state and the, uh, compute the transition and conversion probabilities uh, going from one state to the other. Um, and we did that for all available data sets with a longitudinal follow-up. Um, the cohorts, of course, uh, need to share the covariates under investigation. And we have to deal, as usual, with missing data problems, which is actually one of the uh, bigger problems. But there are modern AI approaches that uh, allow us actually to uh, cope quite nicely and in an elegant way uh, with missing data uh, imputations. So for us, this means that we looked at Adli Eibel, the Australian uh, study, Jatni, uh, which is the Japanese version of Adni, Rosmat, religious orders, uh, um, study at Neuromed, which was Simon Lovestone's uh, huge British, actually the first um, and, and largest um, uh, large scale study, uh, and NACC. And uh, you see here the number of participants, uh, how many um, participants we have in those studies, and how many transition events we uh, have in, uh, represented in those, in those um, studies. This plot shows you uh, for the hazard ratios, the influence of covariates like sex and age and education and APOE and MMSE given uh, um, a, a specifically computed for each individual study. And you see how strong uh, the, um, the uh, the variation is uh, on, the, on the side of some of the, um, the studies representing or reflecting probably uh, heterogeneity in the recruitment, for instance. Yeah, that, that, that is something that um, tells you, this plot essentially tells you the influence in a given study uh, of a covariate on the uh, transition probability from control to MCI in that case. Um, and then the sojourn time is the expected time spent in a diagnosis state, uh, which tells you also to what extent are the, um, the studies comparable when you look at the time that people stay in control or in uh, MCI um, state. And that's something we computed for each and individual cohort again. When we look at the transition probabilities, um, so as a, as a function of estimated transition probability in a five-year period, um, we see give for, for control and control to MCI transitions and control to AD uh, transitions, um, we see quite dramatic differences between different studies. Um, not really surprising given uh, different genetic backgrounds and different compositions of um, covariates. But it was essential to do that 
and to, um, to get a clue on the heterogeneity um, in, the, in the transition probability on this side here on the left side from control. So people, even including people going directly from, from a normal state into AD, which is a rather rare event, uh, and the MCI um, uh, reversion here to control or the MCI uh, sojourn time staying in that uh, diagnostic state or the conversion from MCI into AD. So we basically see um, significant differences in estimated conversion risk um, um, when we plot the probability uh, over time, typical observation time in those studies is something like five years, so 60 months, um, and uh, probability of no AD conversion from control and probability of no AD conversion from MCI, and you see essentially the same over time what you have seen in the, in the um, histograms before. What does that tell us? we have problems um, or we have a heterogeneity. Maybe they don't have problems. We have a heterogeneity uh, when it comes to um, th these different referential studies. Uh, we have to be careful to, to generalize from observations, for instance, done in ADNI. And, and I have to say our entire domain is massively, our entire neurodegeneration research domain is massively influenced by the over analysis of ADNI. Uh, and, uh, my expectation would be that not 50% of all the bold statements made on uh, ADNI analysis uh, hold true uh, if they are, if people try to generalize them uh, via um, testing on, on other um, longitudinal studies as we did it. Now, when we come back to the initial question, how similar are the cohorts? Um, we, we did something that was, uh, um, pretty straightforward from all the previous work that I just told you. We, we looked at the trained models uh, uh, for the representation of the independent cohorts, uh, analyzed the likelihood, uh, the pairwise uh, log likelihoods between those uh, models and clustered uh, the pairwise likelihoods for the individual uh, studies. And what you see here as a as a uh, clustering event is that uh, ADNI and JADNI are actually uh, quite similar. Uh, Adneuromat and IBL are, are rather comparable over a larger space of uh, variables. Uh, and uh, ROSMAP stands, um, stands out a bit. Um, in summary, this sort of systematic analysis of different longitudinal progression cohorts has allowed us to make the following um, or gain the following insights. First of all, significant differences exist in patterns mined across the cohorts. That's just what I um, uh, showed you during the last few minutes. Um, the cohort biases are strong and are so strong that they are learned by the models. That we, that we generated. Um, this has an impact on model generaliza generalization and the question to what uh, extent we are allowed to generalize uh, findings uh, made in, a, in an individual cohort. The clustering that we have done uh, on, based on likelihood uh, provides a good estimate for likeliness, likeliness uh, between cohorts uh, beyond the summary statistics. And uh, the, the landscape that we developed or that we explored essentially helps people now uh, in finding suitable combinations for uh, discovery and validation cohorts. Uh, so essentially you can define subgroups inside of longitudinal cohorts that are a best match for a given question. Now, one of the biggest challenges um, in, in our world is also to identify um, the mechanisms underlying the progression patterns we observe. So what is the mechanism, essentially asking what are the mechanisms that contribute to fast progression or to conversion or to a sustained uh, sojourn time in a, in a, in a uh, acceptable 
um, in a healthy state or in a, in a mild cognitive impairment state, but avoiding, uh, avoiding real dementia. And we have been working on, on a variety of uh, uh, methods um, to associate the knowledge graphs that we generated that represent our disease mechanisms with uh, patient level data uh, and do an interpretation, a mechanism-based interpretation of, uh, of the disease trajectories that we observe. Uh, and a recent one is this um, new um, algorithm or new algorithmic approach for this association, uh, actually an embedding of patients into a knowledge graph. So rather trying to uh, embed a knowledge graph in a, in a patient level data set, um, we, we take it the other way around. And that's work that will be published very soon. So it's, it's not yet uh, submitted, but the paper is in preparation. We take patient level data and the knowledge graph, and we can take all the knowledge graphs that I've shown you in the beginning of my talk, which is, for instance, for Alzheimer's, the 124 different um, mechanism graphs. We do an embedding of patients based on the distribution of a parameter into the knowledge graph. We create a new patient representation, which is essentially a knowledge graph populated by patient subgroups that can be associated with different parts of the knowledge graph. Um, we can generate vectors derived from those representations and use them for all sorts of uh, machine learning and AI applications, including classification, clustering, uh, simulation, and predictions. Does it work? Yeah, uh, we have been testing in a couple of benchmarking experiments that the new uh, patient representations, uh, when compared to raw data, actually uh, show a, my, uh, a way better discrimination. Um, that was something that we uh, initially needed to, to test. Um, the, the machine learning models were able to distinguish uh, different groups and patients better in CLEP representations as compared to raw data uh, representations um, by a margin of 25%. The idea is now really to do this systematically and use CLEP as an algorithm for uh, mechanism-based subgroup representation. Um, identifying mechanisms that are specific to patient subgroups and explain in the best way the distribution and the, um, let's say the, rep the, the distribution of parameters in, in a given cohort. Um, that hybrid approach needs to be tested, of course, uh, on a lot of different, uh, different uh, cohort data. Uh, again, the generalization aspect but uh, we are pretty optimistic that this will work out fine. And uh, uh, it, it really may allow us, um, based on all the previous work, you know, which was quite tedious on pre-processing and polishing and cleaning uh, longitudinal data sets, we are now in the position to systematically run all our, um, our mechanism, disease pathophysiology mechanism graphs against all our longitudinal patient level data, which is quite uh, a step forward, um, coming way beyond the end of the Echonomy project, which ended in the uh, end of uh, 2018. But essentially, this is the way how to establish a mechanism-based taxonomy of disease in the Alzheimer field and in the Parkinsonism field, but it can be ported to any disease area. And with that, I skip the virtual cohort um, aspects here. I would like to come to the last slide, which is the summary and conclusion. I want you to take home the following messages. We organized all data and all knowledge in an entire indication area, and this is possible now. Take home that the time is over where you work on a single data set or where you work on a uh, you know, some sort of transgenic mouse and you torture it this way and you torture it that way and so on this time is simply over. We have to go for all the data, all the knowledge and use computational approaches to uh, make them computable, interoperable, talk to each other and, uh, and get the most out of it in, in the synopsis of all data and all knowledge. Um, we have developed and we are still 
continuing to develop algorithms that link data and computable knowledge um, and that enable us to perform mechanism-based stratification as you have just seen it in my last slides. Um, we can even simulate entire uh, cohorts. I didn't have the time to go into any detail there, but it's also a nice fit uh, to what Petra was saying um, about uh, uh, you know, virtual or simulated brains, even at individual level, we have complementary activities um, uh, simulating entire cohorts. And uh, the, the fun part and the really cool part will come if the two worlds, um, the one that I just represented and the world of uh, uh, TVB that um, Victor and, and Petra stand for really come together, you know, if they, they really um, integrate and, and then we are a big step forward. And uh, with that, I acknowledge and, and thank all the people, you know, in my team and uh, uh, also the European taxpayers, by the way, who pay the entire show, uh, the Virtual Brain Cloud project and the Epsonomy IMI project. Thank you. So I'll now stop sharing and there I'm back. Thank you, Martin, for this very nice presentation. And now we will have Victor Giersa. Perfect, uh, Professor Victor Giersa is the director of the Institute de Neuroscience de Système at Aix Marseille University in France, and is a director of research at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, CNRS. Since the late 90s, he has substantially contributed to our understanding of how network structure uh, constrains the emergence of functional dynamics using methods from nonlinear dynamic system theory and computational neuroscience. Professor Girsa has been awarded several international and national awards for his research, including the Early uh, Career Distinguished Scho uh, Scholar Award in 2004, and the Francois Ebsman Prize in 2001. Since 2005, he has been the leader of the Virtual Brain Neuroinformatics Project and the Work Package Leader in the Human Brain Project. So, Victor, we can see your presentation now. Good morning, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you. And I will uh, deliberately, I'm uh, going to, uh, actually take a completely different perspective because my two colleagues, uh, Petra and Martin, uh, they are uh, already entered into quite some detail with regard to their different approaches and our work is actually quite complementary. Um, and uh, the perspective that I wanted to provide you with is uh, deliberately a little more theoretical, which will help to hopefully contextualize before. And uh, uh, one aspect I'd like to point out is that Alzheimer's disease, it, as it has been mentioned before, is a multifactorial disease. There are many different mechanisms that can uh, contribute to this, and they're not exclusive. Several have been mentioned, tau phosphorylation, A-beta aggregation. Uh, there are different ways how they can express themselves. And how can we, when we take a modeling approach in order to not only identify hypothetical mechanisms, but also to predict possible future interventions. How can we make sense out of this? What can provide us with guidance? Yeah, we can implement many mechanistic hypotheses and move forward, but we do not necessarily know which one applies to one particular patient. Yeah, so personalization is a very important uh, aspect. Guidance and positioning in a multi-dimensional, multi-factorial world is, is another one. Yeah, and uh, there I want to uh, go back actually in the history of science and. Uh, remind you on some uh, two, two giants in the theory of emergence and self-organization. What you see here is Hermann Haken, a pioneer uh, that has contributed in the 60s, 70s, 80s to the understanding of uh, uh, complex systems and self-organization. And uh, his colleague, Ilya Brigogin, is uh, 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 shown underneath. Both have contributed in chemistry and in physics to the emergence of patterns, of the gen uh, understanding of how patterns are being generated in complex systems. And there you also on the level of Hermann Haken, you see also the vase phase picture where you are having two perceptual states, 
either the faces or the days uh, uh, emerging and uh, arising out of uh, your visual system and your complex system, the brain generating this perception. So there are mechanisms in place and I'd like to actually enter into a little more detail because I'd like to connect this uh, back to the brain. And Herman Harkin has pushed the theory of synergetics forward where you see here a cartoon representation of a complex system in order to show pattern formation. What you have to have is nonlinearity, complexity, interactions in the system. And very importantly, the system is driving you away from the thermodynamic equilibrium. Otherwise we are in the world of dead matter thermostatistics. Yeah? So it drives us away from that. And at certain points, we call this phase transition points, patterns emerge, which you see in the simulation here, and then uh, structures or motives, mm, uh, templates are emerging. This can be a thought, this can be a percept, like in the phase vase picture. In Harkin's case, it was a laser activity or superconductivity where he made, made con uh, major contributions. In Ilya Brigogine's case, it was the explanation of chemical reactions, and there you common to them is that you have a huge dimension reduction, uh, which means essentially you have a very complex system and everything reduces onto small subspaces represented here by a uh, sphere where the dynamics is attracted down to a spherical surface. It's maybe a million dimensional space yeah, represented by laser atoms, for instance, but then it's contracted onto a low dimensional subspace. It can be also billions of neurons. Yeah? And then this happens at certain working points in the neighborhood of phase transitions. Yeah? We do not have this in the brain. Yeah? We need to generalize this. We need a new entry points that helps us to position our understanding and our works. And one aspect that has emerged over the last 10 years of neuroscience is what we call equivariant systems. And essentially their symmetry plays a very important role. And I'll provide you with an example. Yeah? Here you see a network connected by different links and if you uh, keep, uh, keep them completely disconnected yeah what can happen or what typically happens is that in a very high dimensional space imagine this to be an n-dimensional network the dynamics goes down to individual points and then uh, on a what we call a fixed point or stationary state but then there is no dynamics along there yeah and what happens is when you break the symmetry you go from this state that state and introduce a very tiny symmetry breaking yeah then actually what can be shown mathematically in the theory of dynamic systems equivariant dynamic systems you have actually a dynamics that emerges it is low dimensional even though that the system is very high dimensional billions of degrees of freedom but there you can occupy different subspaces even having multiple states being occupied not simultaneously, but you can flip from one state to the other. And this is an, a scenario, this low dimensionality occurs in the neighborhood of uh, uh, symmetry. So that provides us suddenly with a new working point that is a fully symmetric point that we can exploit and actually put back in the context of brain sciences. And this is uh, work that is happening over the last 10 years. As Petra was talking about, we build virtual brains from individual brain images make a parcellation and we build a network out of this and we extract from an individual spatial brain also his or her connector put this together co-register this and then span in three-dimensional physical space a virtual brain of this particular patient yeah but now we can take this what i told you about symmetry and emergence it's not just empty jargon we can actually in this framework we can develop it systematically yeah in order to posit very clear questions. For instance, you can start with the network completely disconnected, and then you start turning on the connectome and breaking the symmetry of the individual patient and investigating what is actually happening in the system. And we can do this along a particular paradigm, for instance, resting state a paradigm, a paradigm we use a lot in aging and in healthy and pathological aging studies, typically fMRI, the bold signal, where the connectome then can be represented by a structural connectivity matrix. This is a person's connectome, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. And then dynamics evolves over time for individual brain areas that can be measured in the scanner. And what is typically being done is out of this, you apply 
standard approaches, we, uh, you apply covariance measures, so cross-correlation matrices, and you compute what is called the functional connectivity. This is what you use to interpret these signals. Functional connectivity means covariance measured over 20 minutes of a particular patient. This has proven to be very powerful to perform stratifications of patients, uh, but very poor when you want to uh, individualize the dynamics. Why? Because when you look at this, when you perform a sliding window analysis here across that, you see actually that the dynamics changes. It's non-stationary. That's actually very important. And one way to uh, uh, demonstrate this even better is you can compute a functional connectivity just for one time window here. And then you shift it by a time shift and compute another one and another one and another one. And then you correlate them. You build a cross correlation matrix, but in this case of functional connectivities. Please uh, uh, follow me here. Now this is time, the dimension. And what you find here are individual squares of very high correlation. So this invariant functional connectivity. This is experimental data and what you can find. So this would be the 20 minutes. So this is a time series I showed you earlier. But the way how this can be interpreted is uh, the following. As you're in one of these squares of invariant functional connectivity and this is experimental data, you hang around in a subspace that is low dimensional. So invariant functional connectivity, low dimensional as in the theory of uh, symmetric uh, self-organizing systems where the activity evolves. And then suddenly within one or two time points, puff, 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 you go somewhere else in a different subspace and then you evolve over time there. This is another cluster of dynamics. This is what we find in the data, yeah? So now we can go back into the theory and uh, interrogate this systematically. We go back into the fully symmetric case, fully unconnected uh, uh, case and start turning on the connectome. This is what we do here, factor G, scaling it up, making it stronger and stronger. This is the mathematics that we use that is behind that. Please ignore this for the time being. And this is, uh, yeah, yeah, this is uh, irrelevant for our discussion here. But what you see is the following. At different points, as you turn up, the connectome's influence becomes stronger. And at some point, what is plotted here for the different G values is the FCD. You see that we start finding realistic biologically realistic FCD in a certain area here, not before, not above, but there is a regime that is biologically realistic as I showed you in this uh, 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 one page, uh, patient example before. What happens, we can actually go into these regimes and then uh, reduce some of the dynamics and look at how the dynamics is organized. So for very, very low impact of a connectome, it's symmetric. All is symmetric, no impact of the connectome. And then the substases start emerging and showing some structure. This is exactly what we observe in the FCD. So in the FCD, yeah, you find an organization like this. This is, uh, and then you find these clusters, which we have color coded here. And I'm going now into the individual clusters and actually the complete subspace, the complete link between structure and function is uh, instantiated here by geometry. We call this a manifold. This is what corresponds to the inter FCD here, but for different clusters color coded here, blue is here, green is here. Uh, you get an occupation of different parts of the manifold. And you see this actually, uh, if you take its uh, classical approach and pl uh, plot functional connectivity, this so-called second order statistics, you're trying to plot and fit uh, ellipsoid to this. You will get absolutely nothing out of this. And this explains why personalization has not been successfully accomplished on the level of brain imaging, even though this is our uh, key paradigm uh, that we use in healthy or pathological aging studies. You see a visualization now of what I just told you. The time course goes across the FCD here over what, uh, 500, 600 seconds, so about 10 minutes. The corresponding functional connectivities that go along with that. And here you see the manifold that is actually being sampled. And you see that parts of them, so it's this manifold, but now plotted over time. And you see you are hanging out, you're sampling this part of the manifold. 
Then you go over there as it organizes this. You do exactly these jumps as I illustrated to you before. This was synthetic data coming from the virtual brain. Here you have empirical data. And you can actually start validating and verifying how much truth is in that, how much reality is that for individual subjects that I just told you. This is the empirical data, the FCD of one subject, 52 seconds sliding window size. And what we just discussed is uh, the organization of the dynamics occupying different subspaces. So here what I'm pl plotting are nonlinear components, similar to principal components, but nonlinear uh, components, network-based, uh, identifying the individual subspaces directly from the experimental data. In order to check the reality of the system, we actually can uh, create surrogates, a phase randomized surrogate, which is actually preserving the structure and the FCD but it's uh, changing the different, what we call structured flows on manifold C subspaces. Yeah? Uh, or a time shuffled surrogate, which actually completely destroys the structure, showing you that the notion of subspace interpretation is actually meaningful to some degree. Yeah? We can go and test this systematically in the virtual brain, synthetic data in two regimes. We can test it in the mouse, put it in the scanner, or do this to 150 mice, which we have done or to human subjects, yeah? So here it has been done for a cohort of uh, 15 subjects. Later I'll talk about aging, there it is 85 subjects. FCD for mouse, human, data. And here you can compute the co-activations to ask the question, what is actually happening in the system in these clusters of organization? And you see actually that there are avalanches of co-activation propagating through the networks, both in the human during these clusters, in the mouse, and in the simulations. I'm running out of time, so uh, this is happening statistically significantly. We can track age, this is FCD, age 18 years, 56 years, 72 years, quantify this, making statistics out of the mathematically, it's a conditional probability, but it, it ten, it's a for, form of fluidity. Yeah, of the organization, you can see it with the naked eye, essentially, that when you're older, healthy, aging, you're occupying much more time in individual subspaces or uh, posed negatively, you have difficulties to jump from one subspace to another and explore that. Statistically, you can map this for resting state data or cognitive uh, coordination tasks. Yeah, in red, it's a cognitive task. In blue is individual subjects for the cognitive data, and you get very good correlations with that, with the age actually, and this becomes a very good predictor in terms of age, the fluidity that we observe in the FCD. So having said this, what I wanted to communicate to you here is Alzheimer's disease, pathological aging, also healthy aging, it's highly multifactorial. We need guidance coming from theory that provides us in the big multidimensional mechanistic possibilities, the repertoire, uh, guidance of how, uh, what we measure, how we represent it. And this has led us here to an individual specific FCD representation that we can actually quantify that is informed not only via jargon, but systematically by mathematical theory of self-organization and now in the future allows us for causal inference. I thank you for your attention. I thank my colleagues and friends here, and I thank the funders. Thank you. Thank you kindly, Victor, for this really nice presentation. And now I will give the word to Angela, who will help me with questions and answers for the next five minutes. Great, many thanks, uh, Katrina, and thank you to all the three speakers uh, for very clear and engaging presentations. Uh, I'll start by addressing some of the questions in the chat box. So first of all, um, there was a question for Petra and probably for all of you more generally. How does the simulation procedure take into account the so-called constitutional and environmental related brain reserve and cognitive reserve? Right. Yeah, thank you for this uh, great uh, question, Claudio. 
Um, indeed, we are taking exactly this into account. Um, we started doing this um, with healthy individuals using the human connectome project data, where we have a lot of um, cofactors available, including lifestyle factors, um, uh, uh, cognitive scores, and uh, uh, several other data. So what we do is we identify covariates for um, observations in our empirical imaging data. So basically the bridge between the modeling and the um, additional factors like lifestyle factors and education is always via the imaging data. And uh, you, you are probably um, uh, aware that there is such a positive negative axis um, uh, in the lifestyle um, factors represented in brain activity and functional uh, connectivity. So it has been shown actually based on the human connectome project data and other cohorts that um, lifestyle factors are represented in the functional connectivity of the brain. And this is exactly where then the modeling comes in. We can uh, mimic, uh, simulate uh, these changes of functional connectivity that are paralleled by the lifestyle factors and then infer the mechanism, how these altered um, uh, functional connectivity really impacts the neuronal um, processing. And we are actually now um, writing a paper together that finds um, effects of the functional connectivity on cognitive processing. This, uh, we can explore this by plugging into our virtual brain models cognitive models, models that are able to do decision making and that can express working memory and within different uh, the connectomes that express different functional connectivities, they behave differently and perform differently. And this is how we step by step reveal the mechanisms um, uh, that lead to different cognitive performances and that have their origin also in lifestyle and, and other factors. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you very much, Petra. So um, do you think that with adding these multiple layers on, as you mentioned, incorporating different aspects of some of the testing procedures that people undergo when being diagnosed, will we eventually be able to develop holistic models that go from brain simulation, reaching out to all the other multifaceted aspects that take into account the lives of people with dementia and their clinical experiences um, of the disease? So I would like to give the word now to one of the other speakers because I talked a lot or do, do, shall I respond to this question? I could ask actually a more general question because I'm seeing we're running a little bit low on time and I just wanted to ask a question more generally about European brain research because each of you is involved in very large projects, some under the banner of the Human Brain Project but also projects funded by the Innovative Medicines Initiative and, and where do you see the future for these interactions and these interactive projects and where will the benefit come for EU taxpayers in the future? Yeah, so here I really would like to jump in because I, I have personally a big vision here. So first of all, of course, it is very important to build the bridges between all the different initiatives and to work together. And finally, I hope this will result in kind of health data hubs um, across Europe and maybe beyond where systematically following certain standards that are guided by the scientists um, the data are being um, acquired by the, from the European population, starting already with, with healthy um, uh, individuals and then following up, uh, of course, um, in the course of different diseases, because this is the type of data that we need and that in the long term also will decrease um, the, the disease burden, but also the, the economic impact of, of, of the brain diseases. Even so, uh, on first sight, it looks like it will be very expensive to have these uh, European health data hubs uh, where you have imaging um, uh, methods available that are costly, but in the long run, this will um, pay out because uh, we will save a lot of money as a society for um, um, trying to um, mitigate or um, um, relieve the, the consequences of brain disease at a later point. Yes, Martin and Victor, do you have a comment for that? Yeah, I would like to add to this. Uh, um, uh, data 
uh, and very well curated data will help us uh, to move forward, but this is not good enough. Yeah, because at some point, uh, 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 just the organization and the parsing and the curation of the data will not necessarily generate uh, new knowledge. And this is what we find in the current uh, artificial intelligence approaches. The entire AI community uh, has been pushed by what we call statistical inference, trying to extract the structure and understand the structure that is in the data. But uh, so this statistical inference. But if you want to make a clear statement about what is not in the data, so go beyond the data and explore new uh, avenues, of, for instance, new interventions, yeah, you have to have a hypothesis. Yeah? Another word for hypothesis is a candidate mechanism. Another word is model. Yeah? This is called causal inference. You have to have a causal uh, hypothesis candidate uh, that is being uh, tested. This you can then combine with uh, higher order statistics and uh, you can actually uh, uh, make very, very clear predictions, but it's actually extremely difficult. There you need guidance from theory and you need high performance computation. And now coming, uh, uh, coming back, making the loop to the question that you actually ask, this is not possible only within a single laboratory for this, you need collaborative uh, research, not but uh, by two or three laboratories, but you, we need a culture change. And this is uh, in the neuroscience, and this is what is actually uh, happening in Europe right now with uh, the individual projects, but also the network of networks of uh, European projects building huge infrastructures like it's happening in the Human Brain Project with eBrains that allows then other laboratories and other consortia also to tap in, to share data, share insights, share knowledge, strategies, workflows, uh, and theory, yeah? And uh, it doesn't help if we have 2,500 models. At the end of the day, we need one single model that needs to be consistent, but sufficiently complex to address all these questions. This is why we need European collaborative research, and it's happening. Fantastic, I think that's a brilliant note to end the session on. Thank you very much to all our speakers for participating. I'll leave the last word with Katerina as the session chair. I just want to thank everybody for their presentations and for the discussion. Um, I hope that uh, everybody uh, got a take home message. Uh, it was very interesting. And once again, thank you to Alzheimer's Europe and all the presenters. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bon appétit pour moi. Bye-bye. Thank you to all.